Um, and if Bill comes on, I'll let him take over. Um, welcome everyone to the October Council on Aging meeting. Um, I'm Angela Bartlett, not Dottie Livers, um, as is on the screen. Um, and I'm the Aging Services Manager here um, at the CAC Office on Aging. Um, <clears throat> today we met as an executive committee and we discussed um, the basically goings on of the office. Um, we're planning on meeting again in November on the 9th. Um, and let me look at the agenda real quick. Um, not too much to report. Uh, the Council on Aging Executive Committee um, is very concerned with senior issues here in Knox County. So if you know of any, um, especially uh, regarding advocacy, so if you know of any um, issues that you may like to be addressed, especially at the state level, um, we have sent in letters of support to um, different, um, different uh, senators and Congress people um, and then, of course, um, at the you know, the governor. Um, so please feel free to get involved. And then the next um, thing I want to tell you is the Office on Aging report. We've been very busy here, and we have one big upcoming event I want to touch on. Aging a Family Affair is happening next month. We are. It's a two prong event. The in person portion is going to be a senior expo that will be outdoors held at O'Connor Senior Center um, on Wednesday, November 3rd from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Um, we do have a rain plan, but if you are interested in learning more, you can visit our website at knoxseniors.org or you can call the office at 865-524-2786. Um, the other thing that, um, the other part of the event is that it is a, um, there's, we're having it online, um, Thursday, November 4th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. and it's $15 registration fee, but if you are a senior or a student, we can give you a scholarship. Um, so you could just call our office at 865-524-2786 for more information about that. We have topics including um, caregiving support, uh, online scams, preventing um, cyber crimes, the uh, power of attorney, why is it so important, tools to manage your mental health, and then an update on Medicare and Social Security. So please be sure to look on our website for the um, Aging and Family Affair information. We're really excited about this event and hopefully next year in 2022, we'll be able to have this event in person again. Um, but right now, I would like to introduce our speaker. Um, he is not a stranger to Council on Aging. In fact, he's on our executive uh, committee is Dr. Joel Anderson. One second, Joel, I want to read your bio real quick. Um, Dr. Joel Anderson is an associate professor at the University of Tennessee College of Nursing. His research program focuses on the non-pharmacological interventions for symptom management and caregiver support in Alzheimer's disease and dementia care. He's an elected fellow of the Gerontological Society of America. He is also an active member of the International Dementia Scholars Collaborative and the International Family Nursing Association, um, as well as many other honor societies and research societies. Welcome to the program, Joel. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Angela, and um, thank you for inviting me to be part of the Council on Aging meeting again today. I'm happy to talk about um, the topic that I talked about the last time, actually, um, positive changes for better brain health and what can we do to potentially um, keep our brains as healthy as possible as we age. So, a colleague of mine um, who you may know if you listen to WUOT's um, program, Health Connections, Dr. Carol Myers, 
has said in presentations before that data make us credible, but stories make us memorable. And I wholeheartedly believe that. And actually this morning I was talking to Dr. Myers on health connections and will be on next week talking about some of my research, but I wanted to start with the story and then go to the data. And I start with a story about why I do what I do. So I am from Grayson County, Virginia, which is the little blue county on the map there on the left. And it's right where Tennessee, North Carolina and Virginia meet. That's the western tip of the county that I'm from in the Appalachian Mountains. And on the right, you see a photograph of me as a very small infant um, on one knee and my great grandmother Marie on the other knee and then my grandmother standing behind us over in Cherokee, North Carolina. And the reason that I do what I do and I tell the story that I tell is because my great grandmother Marie was diagnosed with dementia when I was um, in college. And I watched as my grandmother, her daughter, and my mother, her granddaughter, took care of her and oftentimes put their own health on hold, their own needs on hold so they could provide care for my great grandmother. Caregiving is a grand Southern tradition and something that we do in the Appalachian region all the time, as is sometimes neglecting our own health. And so as I watched the impact of the caregiving on all three of these people and helping as much as I could from a distance, um, that inspired my research program. None of those women are still physically present. And so I do what I do to help support caregivers and families living with dementia and also hopefully so that people who did not know my great grandmother, grandmother and mother can learn something about who they were through me and the work that I do. I also like this quote from Rosalind Carter. Um, she is the wife of former president uh, Jimmy Carter and started the Rosalind Carter Caregiving Institute, which is celebrating its birthday this year. And she says that there are only four kinds of people in the world. Those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be, and those who will need them. And that's so very true that throughout the course of our lives, we're going to be in one of these roles and shuffling around within these roles. And so that's why I focus on caregiving and dementia caregiving in particular. So that's the story part. But what about the data? Well, so these are some of the data from 2020 from the Alzheimer's Association. Alzheimer's disease continues to be the sixth leading cause of death in the United States, but it is the one for which we have no treatment, no effect. We have very few effective treatments and no cure. And one in three older adults will die from Alzheimer's disease or dementia in this country, which is more than breast cancer and prostate cancer combined. And it's estimated that last year, in terms of healthcare costs, that we spent $305 billion in this country alone on caring for people with Alzheimer's disease. And there are 16 million people in this country who are providing unpaid care to family members with Alzheimer's disease, those family caregivers. And they're providing nearly 18 billion hours of unpaid care every year. And that care is valued at $244 billion. I don't know about you, but I've never seen $305 billion. So I can't even conceptualize that. So I did some math and I figured out that $305 billion a year comes out to $34 million an hour. Now I've never seen $34 million, but I can better understand that as an amount than $305 billion, but still that's a lot. Nearly, thir nearly $35 million an hour, every hour of every day, every year, we're spending on just Alzheimer's disease and dementia. But that doesn't include those $244 billion worth of care that family caregivers are providing. That's another 27 million, almost $28 million an hour. And so the combined costs of medical costs and the care that families are providing in this country is nearly $63 million an hour. And it's only going up as I've updated these slides since I talked to you last a couple of years ago. But what does that look like here in Tennessee? Well, in Tennessee, there are 120,000 individuals, people who are living with Alzheimer's disease or some type of dementia. And it's estimated that there'll be about 3,500 deaths from dementia per 100,000 people in the state of Tennessee, which gives us the fourth highest mortality rate in the US in terms of dementia. A couple of years ago, 
we were the first. We had the highest mortality rate in 2017. So we've, we've come down a little bit. There are estimated 444,000 caregivers living in Tennessee and caring for someone with Alzheimer's disease or dementia. And they're providing 506 million hours of care every year. So that's roughly 1,100 hours per year per caregiver just in Tennessee. So that unpaid care that those 444,000 Tennessean caregivers are providing is worth $6.6 .6 billion. So you can see that it's not just a national problem, it's a state level problem. And so it's important to do everything that we can to keep our brains as healthy as possible. And that's because caregivers also incur additional healthcare costs for themselves. Remember I said that my grandmother and my mother put their own health on hold to care for my great grandmother. And those additional healthcare costs are estimated at $291 million in Tennessee alone for those caregivers, which is an additional $662 per year for caregivers. So those are kind of crazy statistics and it's hard to wrap our brains around that, but we need to so that we can keep our brains healthy. So the last time I spoke to you, there was a paper that came out in one of the medical journals that's been around for a very long time, The Lancet, that talked about current research as of 2017 and ways that we can prevent dementia and prevent cognitive decline and keep our brains healthy. They've recently updated that to add some additional things. So I'm gonna focus on what we know as of right now in terms of research and the things that we can do to help keep our brains healthy. Because you can see from this graphic on the right, the risk factors for dementia that came out of this research, this cumulative research. And about 7% of that is something that happens in early life and the, the amount of education that we're able to take care, uh, take advantage of when we're young. The more uh, formal years of education we have, the, that decreases our risk of Alzheimer's disease or dementia. And then a lot of things can happen in mid to late life that are things that we can potentially modify. And if you look at the bottom, there's about 40% of our risk of dementia that we can modify. And so those are the things that I'm going to go through. And those things include things like hearing loss, managing high blood pressure or hypertension, obesity, smoking, depression, physical inactivity, social isolation, and diabetes. And you can see here again on the right, I've blown up that graphic, that you know, hearing loss, can in taking care of that, that contributes 8% to our risk of dementia. Something like smoking, 4%. All these little things add up to 40% of modifiable things that we can take care of. Now, the new things that have been added this year um, that I haven't had a had chance to really delve into more um, closely, they've added um, traumatic brain injury, excessive alcohol intake, so more than 21 units per week, and air pollution. So we're starting to see how the effects of climate change and the climate crisis also have an impact on our brains and our health. It's also important to point out that when I did this presentation before, we were all in O'Connor and in person. And as Angela pointed out, we're not doing that right now. We're doing this virtually because we can't negate the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on our daily lives, but also on our brain health. And we've seen a lot of information in the news and in the media about the vulnerability of older adults and how older adults can be are at greater risk of severe COVID and some of the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. But there's also some good news and some good research that points out that older adults have increased resiliency and that in some cases they've been able to weather the storm of this pandemic better than younger adults, and particularly adolescents, because over the course of their life, they've had to deal with a lot of different um, challenges and um, tragedies and opportunities. And so they've built resiliency that in some ways has allowed them to weather the storm of the pandemic. So it's not all bad news, but as you'll see, as we go through some of the different topics and things that you can do to keep our brains healthy, it'll be easy to see how the pandemic plays into some of that as well. So the first thing on that list was hearing loss. 
This may seem kind of weird, but if you think about how the ear works and what it is that promotes hearing loss for those individuals who are living with hearing loss, things that can also be associated more directly associated with dementia like hypertension, cardiovascular disease, inflammation, those kinds of things can have an impact on your hearing and decrease your hearing. And so it may be that some of the risk that we see related to hearing loss is related to some of these other cardiovascular disease risk factors that we know are more directly related to Alzheimer's disease. But researchers uh, in the UK and colleagues of mine in the UK found that when you actually give people who are experiencing hearing loss um, access to hearing aids and other resources that that decreases their risk of dementia by increasing their cognitive function. So it also may be that being able to hear clearly and being able to hear well increases your ability to understand, you know, people who are talking to you to be able to process information and keep your brain active. And so those things that keep our brains active, like crossword puzzles and some of the things that you may have read about hearing and vision and all of our senses play into how our brain works. And if any of those senses are decreased, that can have an impact on our brain function as well. So that's the reason why hearing loss is in that list. It's not just because it could be related to other disease processes that have an impact on dementia, like cardiovascular disease and heart disease, but also because we need to be able to hear well, see well, or as well as we can to be able to get the information that we need. Hypertension was second on that list. And a few years ago, the American Heart Society changed their um, categories for blood pressure to what you see here. It used to be that before um, a blood, a systolic upper number blood pressure of 130 to 139 was considered elevated. Now that's considered stage one hypertension. Essentially, they shifted everything down. And that's one of the reasons that they did that was because of that study that was published in the Lancet about preventing dementia. And that if we're ambitious and aggressive in our control of blood pressure and hypertension, that we can decrease the risk of dementia dramatically. And so the American Heart Association took that information on board and changed the recommendations for blood pressure so that now elevated is 120 to 129, and anything above that is considered either stage one or stage two hypertension. And so a lot of people um, may have gotten, had some conversations with their physicians and healthcare providers after these criteria came out about whether or not they might need to start blood pressure medication or other lifestyle changes that they can make. One of those lifestyle changes, which also ties into some of the other things on the list like obesity, is diet, diet and physical activity. And so the National Institutes of Health, and particular the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, supported a lot of research many years ago to develop what is called the DASH diet or dietary approaches to stop hypertension. And so this DASH diet really is an eating plan all based around decreased salt intake, decreased sugar intake, increased whole grains, and eating foods and a diet that we know from research and science supports lowered blood pressure. And so here's a diagram of some of the foods that you'll find on the DASH diet. It does emphasize whole grains, lots of vegetables, de-emphasizes meat consumption, de-emphasizes dairy consumption, and focuses on low-fat dairy, and really limits the amounts of sweets and added sugars and added fats, as well as the amount of sodium or salt that we're adding to our foods or the foods that we purchase that might have sodium or salt all in an effort to help people manage their hypertension better. So even if you are taking blood pressure med medication, um, paying attention to the foods that you eat and following things on the DASH diet may help you decrease, and de decrease your risk of cognitive impairment even more and help you manage your hypertension better. And if you Google DASH diet, you'll be able to find, so this, this guide here is a freely available guide on the website for the Department of Health and Human Services. And so if you Google DASH diet, you can easily find this eating plan. And it has multiple eating plans for, I believe, people who might um, consume 1,200 calories a day, 1,500 calories a day, or 2,000 calories a day. So it's adaptable for men and women and different body sizes. 
And in addition to having sort of um, sample diet plans of what you might eat uh, over the course of the week, it also includes recipes. So because the good thing about having um, research, health sciences research funded by the government like the National Institutes of Health, is that any research that is funded by the National Institutes of Health has to make its results freely available to the public. And so that's why the DASH diet is out there and freely available because our tax funding, our tax dollars paid for that funding. And so all information from research funded by the government has to be made freely available. But there's another diet. Um, there's some other dietary patterns that have gained attention in terms of their benefits for the brain. One of those is the Mediterranean diet, which is better um, exemplified by the um, image you see here. It really focuses on um, some of the aspects of the DASH diet, whole grains, but really focuses on vegetables and fruits and even decreases more the amount of meat consumption and dairy consumption and things like eggs, and also includes um, nuts and seeds and some spices that we may not commonly use um, in our traditional Southern cuisine like ginger or turmeric or saffron. And so the Mediterranean dietary pattern is also one that's been shown to decrease the risk of developing dementia and Alzheimer's disease. But some clever researchers at Rush University um, in Chicago thought, well, what happens if we combine the two? What happens if we take the DASH diet, the good things about the DASH diet, because it has a focus on cardiovascular disease, and the good things about the Mediterranean diet, and any other nutrition research that we've, that we've developed over the last several years, and develop a new dietary pattern. And so that's exactly what they did. And they called it the MIND diet. And it's the Mediterranean-inspired um, DASH diet for neurodegenerative delay. Yeah, just call it the MIND diet. It really is focused on keeping our brains as healthy as possible. And they took those two dietary patterns and they brought them together and then added some additional information. And that's what you see on this slide here. So for the MIND diet, they found that people who ate at least three servings of whole grains every day, people who incorporated dark leafy greens, salads, and other vegetables into their diet every day, people who were routinely eating berries like raspberries, strawberries, blueberries, blackberries at least twice a week, people who often ate um, small servings of nuts and seeds, one ounce, kind of just like what fits in the palm of your hand, people who ate lots of beans and legumes, who decreased their amount of cons their uh, meat consumption and really focused on things like poultry and fish, who might have had a, a glass of red wine every day and really decreased their amount of fat and cheese and dairy and sweets, had even better outcomes in terms of their brain health. So that it's kind of like the DASH diet is here and the Mediterranean diet is here, but when you put them together, it goes up substantially. And so I know a lot of the folks that I know who are also doing um, research in dementia will share sometimes on Facebook and Twitter on social media, making sure I'm getting my dark leafy greens in today so that I follow the MIND diet. Um, so I, you can Google and find this information. There's a lot of information out about the MIND diet. This was the best sort of graphic infographic that I found that really sort of spells it out. Again, the big, the big thing that they added with the MIND diet was the inclusion of dark leafy greens and dark green vegetables and berries because there was a lot of um, sort of bench science, laboratory science to demonstrate the positive impacts of dark green vegetables and berries on our brains. And so that's kind of the, the big thing that they added when they combined those two dietary patterns. So one of the things that I try to do every day is to eat some berries. And that can be hard to do sometimes in the winter when the berries that we find in the, in the supermarket aren't that fresh and don't taste that great or are really, really expensive. So I get frozen berries. I get frozen berries like frozen blueberries or mixed berries, and I'll make a smoothie of those. And um, with oat milk and protein powder and all those you know, good little supplements, and that's what I'll have for breakfast every day. And then I know, okay, I'm getting in um, my berries and I put some greens in there and I get in my greens so I know at the very least, even if I might, you know, fall off the wagon and have a piece of pizza or something later in the day, I've got my dark leafy greens in and I've got my berries in. 
Social engagement and physical activity are really important for our brains. And we can't negate the fact that the pandemic has had an impact on that because again, we're watching this online and we're not all together in O'Connor. But now that we have vaccines in place and we're able to socialize, um, those are things that are definitely good for us because we're social animals. And so being able to engage in physical activity and being able to engage with each other in different activities are good for our brain. Smoking is on the list. It can increase your risk of dementia by 5%. Um, we've seen lots of research over the years about the impact of smoking and its deleterious effects. I, I don't know that I need to go into great detail there, but it, is a risk, it does affect how our brains work. It does affect our brain health. And so it's important um, as much as possible to um, decrease or stop smoking. Depression. Depression and anxiety, I think one of the, I don't want to call it a silver lining, but one of the, I guess, the more positive things that have come out of the pandemic is that we're more willing to talk about, I think, we're more willing to talk about mental health and recognizing that mental health is just as important as physical health. Um, depression increases our risk of dementia. So people who have a history of depression or people who are living with depression and um, seeking treatment for depression, um, if it goes untreated, it can increase our risk for dementia. One of the ways that we think that might work is because dementia, uh, depression has an effect on the region of our brain that's associated with memory, the hippocampus. Um, so there's part of our brain um, that's kind of shaped like two seahorses with their tails connected to each other. And that's actually why it's called the hippocampus, because hippocampus is the Greek word for seahorse. But it's the memory region in our brain. And in people who are depressed and have a long history of depression, that particularly that goes untreated, um, research demonstrates that the hippocampus actually shrinks. It gets smaller in size. And so that has an impact on our memory. And one of the things that we also see in dementia is that the hippocampus shrinks. So that is one of the reasons why we think that it's related to our dementia risk. Again, the pandemic has pointed out that mental health is health and that we have to take care of our mental health just as much as we have to take care of and pay attention to our physical health. And that's not just a problem that we're seeing here in the United States. So this graph comes from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which is an international organization. And they looked at reports of people experiencing depression or symptoms of depression prior to the pandemic um, and during the pandemic. So the pre-COVID numbers are in the dark blue and the COVID numbers or pan during the pandemic numbers are in the light blue. And you can see that around the world, the number of people who report experiencing depression or symptoms of depression has doubled and in some cases quadrupled, increased five times or more. If you look at places like Korea, South Korea, where the numbers were so small before that you can't even see them on the graph. And now they have the highest rate of reports of depression and symptoms of depression. This graph is about anxiety and the number of people who are experiencing anxiety during the pandemic versus before the pandemic. And again, pre-pandemic numbers are in the dark blue, during the pandemic is in the light blue. All of those numbers have increased. What's interesting is that for people who are experiencing anxiety, symptoms of anxiety and depression during the pandemic, it has increased across the board, regardless of whether you've experienced those symptoms before in the past. So not only are people who have a history of depression and anxiety sometimes finding it harder to manage those symptoms, but people who have never experienced symptoms of depression and anxiety find themselves managing that too. And that's, you know, all of the stress of living in a global pandemic. Um, so it's even more imperative that we pay attention to our mental health because it has an impact on our brain health and our physical health as well. One of the things that we know from research that is good for depression and also good for our brains is exercise and physical activity. 
Now, a lot of times you'll see those two terms used interchangeably. Some people talk about exercise when they mean physical activity, and sometimes people say it physical activity when they mean exercise. So what's the different? What's the difference? Physical activity is simply just being active, taking a walk, um, doing housework, anything that moves our bodies. Exercise is sort of more defined things like I'm going to do aerobics for 30 minutes or I always go for a walk every day for 10 minutes. So if you're putting a definition around it, then it's exercise. But if you're just going for a walk or doing your housework, that's physical activity. So they're related, but sometimes they're used interchangeably. In terms of its benefits on our brain, it can be as simple as taking a walk. Research has demonstrated that uh, 40 minutes of walking three times a week improves our memory. That doesn't mean you have to go out and walk for 40 minutes every time. You could walk for 10 minutes, 20 minutes. It all adds up. Um, the, Department of Health, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services suggests 150 minutes of physical activity or exercise every week for adults in the U.S. But so that can be um, taken care of in a lot of different ways. And they actually emphasize doing different types of physical activity because each have different um, benefits for our physical health as well as our cognitive health or the ways that our brain works. So things like stretching and yoga, like you see in the, in the image here, aerobic activity and strength training, which doesn't mean you have to go to Gold's Gym and use all the all the machines and all the heavy weights. It could be as simple as um, using some small dumbbells at the home or resistance bands or some of the other um, exercises that don't necessarily get your heart rate up, but engage your muscles and your muscle groups. Because each of those have a benefit on our physical health and also have a benefit on our brain health. Because the more physically active we are, the more we secrete um, in our brains, these chemicals that get our brains to grow and to change. And so keeping our brain regions healthy um, is, one re is one way that physical activity keeps our brains um, optimally performing. And again, that social engagement, but also engaging our minds. So in the image here, we see two people working together to solve a jigsaw puzzle. Both of those things um, get our brain working and work different areas of our brain and keep them sort of um, lubricated and working well. So we know that cognitive stimulation, like solving puzzles, um, watching documentaries, reading, anything that gets us thinking is good for our brain, as is social engagement. Being around others, talking to others, um, and um, sharing our lives um, and the events in our lives. We've heard for many years now, and I remember when I went to the aging conference and the, the research had just come out about social isolation and everyone was walking around saying, it's like smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. The impact of having um, decreased um, social engagement is, you know, if people are socially, socially isolated, it's like smoking a pack a day. And that's because we know that when we're around each other, we spend time with our family and our friends, that we have increased social support. They help us manage the stresses of life. And that makes things easier for us in terms of our mental health and our physical health. Again, it's hard to deny the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on these two things, cognitive simulation and social engagement. We were instructed to socially distance to socially isolate, to protect ourselves from the coronavirus. But at what cost? And I'm sure we've all seen the news stories of how nursing homes and care facilities shut their doors and didn't allow families to visit, where families could only visit, you know, through the window and waving at each other or via Zoom. But the good thing is that we have adapted. Lots of us are using technology that we never used before, like Zoom, like WebEx, FaceTime, um, maybe we're engaging in social media and using the internet more than we ever have before. My research, I actually do research on how caregivers use social media and the internet um, to manage their caregiving experience. And one of the things that they do is they use it for social support. And they were doing that before the pandemic, and that's only increased since the pandemic. 
because everybody recognizes the need for that social engagement and social support. So while again, the bad news is that the pandemic has made in some instances made it harder for us to do these things that we know that are good for our brain. The good news is that humans are adaptable and that we've been using technology and new ways of staying engaged. And I know that we all look forward to when, not if, but when we get to be in O'Connor again for the Council on Aging meet, uh, meetings. So again, we've been using technology in new ways, maybe for some of us. Um, I was already meeting with people on Zoom and teaching online, so I didn't have that hard of a pivot. But even for those of us who are already using these technologies, we've become even more reliable, reliant on those technologies. Um, and seeing some of the benefits of those technologies. I think a lot of, I've heard lots of folks say, you know, why wasn't I doing this before? Why wasn't I having story time with my grandkids in Minnesota before? I could do that and keep doing that after the pandemic. So again, we've learned some things during the pandemic that have been good for us and that hopefully will continue after. Another thing that is useful for our brain is, um, letting it rest. As much as cognitive stimulation is good for helping to keeping it working well, it also needs some downtime. Um, so that could be meditation, that could be prayer, um, how, what, however you name it or whatever you do. And that's because again, we have research to demonstrate that those individuals who practice prayer or meditation on a regular basis engage parts of their brains that other people do not. And those regions are regions of the brain that promote learning and memory. And so it stands to reason and has been demonstrated that those individuals who regularly engage in prayer and meditation have better cognitive function, have better brain function, and it protects their brain over time. So mindfulness and stress management can be as simple as taking some deep breaths. So we could take three deep breaths right now at a rate that's good for us. And by taking those deep breaths, it gives our brain a pause. And the longer we practice this and take those pauses, the more our brains and the rest of our body find it easier to communicate with each other. It has a fancy name, psychoneuroimmunology, but it's all about how the brain and body communicate and connect. And so mindfulness and prayer and meditation allow us to sort of calm down the stress response and increase the communication with our brains and our bodies. And again, it increases the size and the activity of the regions in our brain, like the hippocampus that I mentioned earlier, that are important for memory. So it can be deep breathing exercises like we just did. It can be prayer and meditation. It can be more formal practices that also incorporate movement like yoga and Tai Chi, which was on the image of my first slide. Or it can be very specific things like mindfulness-based stress reduction, which was developed by John Kabat-Zinn. And there's a specific um, eight week program for learning how to be more mindful in daily life. Sleep. Sleep is one of the best things that we can do for our brains. And I think we would all love to sleep like a baby, to sleep like this little baby here, um, to have restful, deep sleep and to wake up completely and totally refreshed. But a lot of us maybe sleep like this or don't sleep, in fact, and experience insomnia or don't wake up, we wake up and we don't feel refreshed. Maybe we didn't get enough sleep. The recommendation is seven to nine hours um, every night. Some people can get away with, uh, with less. Some people actually require more. Um, usually we know how many hours of sleep we need for it to be optimal. And the reason that sleep is important for our brains is because, again, scientists, good old scientists and researchers um, discovered in 2012 that there was something going on in the brain that they never paid attention to before. It was just assumed that um, the fluid that's in our brain that keeps our brain lubricated and moves the chemical messengers around in our brains, that cerebral spinal fluid, it was just assumed 
um, that the, the, the waste products and the debris that's floating around in that just naturally sort of floated away and diffused and was flushed out of the brain um, passively, that the brain did nothing to actively get rid of that gunk that we don't need. But what they found was, and again, in 2012, so not that long ago, actually, that when we sleep, these, these, these brain cells here, they're called astrocytes. Um, and you might be able to figure out why they're called astrocytes, because when they were first discovered, uh, scientists thought they looked like stars, astro. They looked like stars in the sky. They found that these astrocytes actually started actively pumping fluid, the fluid in our brain when we slept. And that allowed all of that gunk and garbage and stuff that we didn't need to be more actively removed from our brain. And they called that system the glymphatic system. So we've heard of the lymphatic system and the lymph nodes that we have in our necks and under our arms and throughout our body and how that flushes out stuff that we don't need, particularly infections. But they discovered the glymphatic system and they found that it was only active when we were asleep. Those astrocytes only push that stuff out when we're asleep. And so that's one of the big reasons why adequate and restful sleep is essential to our health because one of the things that gets flushed out during this, this glymphatic system activation when we're asleep is beta amyloid plaques and uh, beta amyloid and tau proteins which are some of the things that we know build up in the brains of people who are living with dementia and cause some of the issues that we see there. And so having a healthy glymphatic system that flushes those things out of our brains while we sleep is important. And so having good sleep and good rest is important as well. And so some of the things that I've talked about today, like mindfulness and stress reduction, physical activity, social support, seeking treatment for or managing our depression, eating a healthy diet, um, decreasing or stopping smoking, all of the things actually that I've mentioned so far help improve our sleep. Also practicing good sleep hygiene. Um, it's okay to take naps, but you don't wanna take multiple naps throughout the day. So if you are a napper, taking one nap instead of multiple naps throughout the day makes it easier for you to fall asleep and stay asleep at night. Having sort of a, a nighttime ritual, closing screens and, and trying not to watch television or being on our, particularly our devices. Our devices have a lot of blue light in them and that blue light activates a region of our brain um, called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. What, is, what, is, what does that do? Um, that's the part of our brain that responds to light and sort of regulates our circadian rhythm so that when the sun comes up, we start to wake up and when the sun goes down, we start to get sleepy. But if we're looking at our devices all night long, right up until we go to bed, our brain still thinks, well, the sun's up, the sun's up, the sun's up. It's not time to go to bed yet. So decreasing the devices that we use, maybe taking a bath or having a cup of chamomile tea or doing a little reading, a little journaling, sort of letting your brain know, okay, okay the day is winding down. I'm not going to be working anymore. Um, it's we're getting close to bedtime, it's time to rest. All of those things that are called sleep hygiene can help improve our sleep. Um, and again, being more physically active, eating you know, something like the mind diet and practicing meditation and prayer, or, um, spending time with our friends and family also help promote sleep as well. So I am happy to answer any questions that you might have, but before I do that, I'm have to put in a research plug. If you have been, if you are a caregiver and you have been using some online caregiving resources, like attending these online Council on Aging meetings, my colleagues and I would love to hear from you. We'd love to hear from you if you've been using any sorts of online resources like webinars or social media or anything as a caregiver during the pandemic to help us understand what that experience has been like so that we can continue to do our research and find ways of supporting you. So if you are interested or you've been doing that and want to get any more information about the study, you can go to caregiving.questionpro.com or you can email me. My email there is down at the bottom, jande147 at utk.edu. 
and I will stop sharing my screen and I am happy to answer any questions that folks might have. Um, I've made it to where you can unmute yourself. Um, I believe if you're on the phone, you might have to press star six. I'm not positive on that, but if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. And it can be about something that I talked about today or some other question you might have about how to keep your brains healthy, something that maybe you saw on the news. Well, I have a question. Yes. Uh, what is the earliest age where dementia start? Could it start when you like, uh, like in your teens or, you know, in the mid age or it just. That's, that's a good question. So one of the things that makes it so hard to, um, that's made it so hard to treat mm -hmm. and so hard to figure out how to prevent is that sort of the changes that happen structurally to your brain that actually make it shrink or make the different regions um, change takes a lot of time. And so when they, it, it may take 10 or 20 years and so it may be that when you're in your 20s and 30s, those changes are already starting to happen. And so that's why it's important to take care of ourselves as soon as we can, as long as possible. Yeah. But in terms of a, of a diagnosis of what's now called young onset dementia, that's, those are people who are like in their 50s who are starting to notice, late 40s, early 50s, who are starting to notice significant changes in memory that have an impact on their life. Um, so, you know, losing your keys every now and then, we all do that. I do that. Everybody does that. But getting in the car and starting on your way to work and then forgetting how to get there, mm -hmm. that's a signal that you, it's a good idea to talk to your healthcare provider and see what might be going on. Okay, and I have another question. Mm -hmm. Did certain type of medications make you forget stuff, you know? <laughs> Yes, so that's why it's important if you're noticing significant changes in your memory or things that are affecting your memory to talk to your healthcare provider. It could be medications that you are taking. It could be um, vitamin or mineral deficiencies. It could be malnutrition. It could be a lot of things that are not dementia. Oh, okay. So it's important to get evaluated because then you can rule out things that are easily or more easily taken care of. If it's a particular medication that you might be taking, then you might be able to switch to a different medication. So that's why it's good to always talk to your physician or healthcare provider if you're noticing changes in your memory that are significant and having an impact on your daily life. Okay, well, thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions? And I'll just throw out that, as Angela said, I am a member of the executive committee for the Council on Aging. So the Office on Aging knows how to find me. So if you think of a question later and you didn't write down my email, they know where to find me. But if you just go to, you know, if you Google the College of Nursing here at the University of Tennessee, it's easy to find me as well. I had a question. Yes. Okay. It may not be a question, but it is, it is uh, for for people who who tell you I'm set in my ways, I'm set in my ways, and and you can see that 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 things have changed and are changing, but they can't. So what can be? How can you uh, you know speak with them or talk with them concerning these things? Mm -hmm. And that... some of them are harm, and some of them are harmful. Yes, that, that can be a challenge. Um, I've, I've experienced that in my family. Um, and so what I suggested to that family member um, is asking to accompany them to their next um, doctor's appointment so that we can have sort of a mediator or a third party or somebody sort of external to our relationship, because sometimes the relationship that you have with the person can make it difficult to have that conversation. And so having someone else there, whether that's the healthcare provider or um, someone from your church, um, 
um, someone from another community organization or another family member or friend that you think they might be more receptive to hearing um, sometimes helps diffuse that situation a little bit. Um, I, I, I experienced this, though, I told you about my great grandmother with dementia. My grandmother, um, she's the person that I had to have that conversation with um, and extremely, as you said, set in her ways and, and did not want to hear what I have to, had to say. And so we had that conversation with her, um, with her doctor present. And then she was more willing to hear what needed to be done. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. Um, the difference between Alzheimer's and sundowners, and if you have sundowners, do you eventually get Alzheimer's or dementia, or can can the sundowners be reversed? Mm -hmm. So sundowning is usually a symptom of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And it refers to, you know, as kind of like I was saying before about how our brain pays attention to the light that's outside. And as it starts to get dark, people might become more agitated or more stressed um, because it's having an impact on their brain. Usually sundowning is part, is a symptom of dementia or Alzheimer's disease. But there are things that you can do to help um, lessen the impact of sundowning. Um, one of the things that we found is actually that if individuals take a nap during the day and the, during the afternoon, people who experience sundowning, that that decreases the impact of that later in the day. Um, they get a little sleep and their brain has a chance to have a break and uh, process the information better so that they don't experience sundowning as significantly as they did before. As well as increasing physical activity. So if you can go for a walk with that person or encourage them to take a nap, that might help with the sundowning. I have a question. Yes. Yes. I have read that you can do brain exercises to help protect yourself from dementia. And the one that caught my attention was like using your left hand to do things you normally use your right hand to do, feed yourself, brush your hair. I've tried it, it's not easy. <laughs> now would that does that actually help prevent dementia? So what they have found is that, um, yes, doing brain exercises keeps your brain active and it keeps all of those little, those astrocytes that I showed you, it keeps all those synapses firing. But what's really important is that you do a variety of brain exercises because our brains learn quite quickly. And so you'll find that over time, using your left hand, if you're right-handed, will become easier. And so the, the cognitive stimulation that you get when you first start it and your brain is trying something new is going to decrease over time. So if you're doing multiple things, like using your left hand instead of your right hand, um, trying crossword puzzles, doing jigsaw puzzles, um, lots of different mind games and mind uh, uh, game apps have been coming out recently. Um, the, the, the key, it's kind of like with the diet, the key is the variety because our brains learn quite quickly. And even if we think, oh, I'm not getting better at this game at all, our brains are getting better at it. And so, what they found in these sort of cognitive training um, research studies where they have people engage in games and, and brain training exercises is that they get really good at that, but then their memory can slip in other ways. And so a variety of different games will hit a lot of the different regions of your brain differently and um, make things better. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, um, thank you, Joel, so much for presenting today. We really appreciate it. Um, My pleasure. It was a wonderful.